if you do have a dream outlet, that's the one I really want to go after because I want that for you. Hello and welcome to the business of architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And today I had the great pleasure of speaking with Roxy Serengi, founder of Roxy PR, a full service public relations, social media consultancy and branding firm. Roxy's PR clients operate around the globe, shaping human experience via the fields of art, culture, architecture, interior design, hospitality, consumer products, luxury lifestyle, and wellness. Based in West Hollywood, Roxy PR attracts the best-in-class clients and tastemakers. Her past and present clients include top interior designers such as Sophie Gwenyu and Ryan Sahagin, uh, who we also had in the show a little while back, EMI Interiors, JHL Design, and furniture designer Ross Vincent. She also leads public relations for the Farhan Foundation, which partners with prestigious institutions in Los Angeles, including the LACMA, Getty Museum, the Getty Villa, the Broad, Broad Stage, and other notable organizations. For more than a decade, Roxy has been the senior PR consultant for Communication Arts and Design Incorporated, which specializes in the cultural landscape of California. During her time at the firm, she has focused on the architecture and design fields, supervising PR and marketing campaigns for PHX Architecture, Ratchelin Partners, Mark Weaver and Associates, Bernard's Snyder Diamond Showrooms, Solai Architectural Services and All Coast Construction, many of which you will recognize as have been previous guests here on Business of Architecture. She also handled the publicity for legendary songwriter Carol Byer Sage's solo art exhibition held at the William Turner Gallery in Los Angeles. So really brilliant to actually have Roxy on as the guest as we've worked with her here at BOA um, for a few years where she's been brilliant in actually helping us have many of the guests that you've enjoyed in the past. So in this episode, we discuss the importance of storytelling, of image shaping, and you telling your story and what that means in the context of PR. Um, Roxy gives us a masterclass in what is PR and why um, it's such a strong and important element in your marketing and we also look into some of the nuances of when is the right time to begin PR what do you need to get the most from it um, are you ready to be doing it what's the kind of traditional PR route and who is it best suited for so a lot of great stuff in this conversation sit back relax and enjoy Roxy Serengi this podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Roxy, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Thank you. I'm doing great. Thank you. How are you? I'm very well. What an absolute pleasure to finally have you as one of the guests on Business of Architecture. Um, you are a, a PR. You're based on the on the West Coast. In You're in Los Angeles, right? Right. Yeah. And... You're a PR that specializes working in the uh, in the design industry, interior designers, architects, and you've been responsible for having many of your clients be brilliant guests on the business of architecture. So for that, I thank you very much. Thank you've always you. been superb. Um, and I know that you've also got a background in the film industry, mm -hmm. in a past life. Theater, film. Did you, did you train in, in theater? Did you train in? Yes. Uh, theater, film, TV, yeah, professional actor. So all mediums. Amazing. Amazing. So it's very interesting. You know, PR is one of these really important aspects of any design practice. It can be a significant investment for, um, for a business, but it can be one of these investments that can really pay back um, mm -hmm. 
you know, good returns if done well and done properly. So I guess my first question is, how did you get into PR? What's your kind of background? Well, um, I, I hate when people say this, but it's very true. I did fall into it. It was, um, and I'll explain why, it really became a natural progression in my my life journey. Um, as you mentioned, I was an actor for many years, professionally trained actor. Um, I graduated from UCLA in English. Um, during my last year at UCLA, I uh, studied and worked for the Getty Institute, um, working a lot with Frank Lloyd Wright requests in their research center. So I've always had an interest in architecture and interior design, uh, but my focus, what I wanted to do was be an actor. So I was for many years, loved it. Um, you know, I always say that in PR, I would never need to know the level of human relations and the psychology behind things to the level that I know now, but it certainly has come in handy. Um, and just decided, you know what, I want to try something new. I had been acting for a long time and the industry is just so unstable. Mm -hmm. And I had spoken to a previous uh, boss at Fox when I was interning for him, when I worked in production and development and when I was acting. And I said, you know what, I'm curious about PR. And he said, my aunt has a PR firm. So why don't you intern for her? So I interned for her and it really felt just like a very natural fit. And from there, I um, ended up getting hired and they threw me all of the creative clients. So anything revolving around lifestyle, but also just anything creative, they're like, give it to Roxy, give it to Roxy, because I loved that. Yeah. And from there, it just kept expanding and growing, worked at other agencies. And then I started my own. And I also consult with another agency that I've been at for many, many years and just really enjoy it. It, it felt very authentic for me to move into public relations. So I, I guess then the kind of interpersonal skills that you developed as an actor and the ability to be able to communicate you know, that's really part mm -hmm. of the backbone here of being a PR. Um, and also, you know, your ability yeah. to be able to understand and interpret a story, I'm guessing. Absolutely. Kind of so I, I mean, you hit it on the nose, um, really telling a story. That's what I look at as a fundamental part of public relations is telling your client's story. So what makes the person unique? What makes the business unique? And telling that story in a creative way that's also persuasive. So in acting, I certainly learned how to make things interesting, how to tell the story, um, really understanding human relations and why we do things. So for me, I love working with the client on the why. Why did you get into interior design? Why is your work different than others? Why architecture? When you designed that performing arts center, when you designed that building, why did you do it this way? What considerations were put into it? Um, what were the challenges? What is something that happened that you wouldn't expect? So just finding out all the layers and asking a lot, a lot of questions like a journalist mm -hmm. and getting that information and retelling that story in a creative, unique way is really a passion of mine. I love telling the story. So, so what, is, um, what, is, what is PR then? How would you describe it to a, like a new client or how do clients know when they need PR? It's, again, it's one of these things that yeah. there's a bit of a status symbol around having a PR as well in architecture. Yes. Certainly there's something kind of cool about, yeah, talk to my, talk to my, talk to our PR. And, and it's talk also, and, and she said exactly, this. exactly. There's a kind of accolade that comes along with it, or there's a marker of success in just being able to hire a PR. Mm -hmm. um, but what is it? How would you, how would you describe it? Well, there's lots of different types of PR, so I'll start there. Because if you talk to one person, they may tell you something different than another. But generally speaking, PR is providing the public with information about your organization or brand um, that's that's done in a positive way. So um, 
really showing uh, how a person feels about the brand or person or company. And as I mentioned, you want it to be positive, right? I read something once that said that PR people are uh, image shapers, which I thought was an interesting way to put it. Um, I look at it as we're storytellers. I'm telling, I'm telling your story in a very authentic way, uh, finding out the truth of why and how you do things and also just showing it and showcasing it in a way that uplifts. I really like mm. uplifting the clients. You know, that's a big, um, I think through line is how can I uplift and showcase their work? So when a client first engages you, what's the, how do you qualify them or how do you make sure that it's the right client and that they're, they're ready for your kinds of services? Is there anything that they need to do to be able to be prepared and to be able to get the best mm -hmm. out of their, out of your services, for example? Yeah, I ask a lot of questions. Uh, one of the first questions is, can I see your work? Um, I need to see if it's aligned with the clients that I have, if they're at a certain place in their career that they're ready for PR. So I ask for images of their work. Um, I look at their website. I look at their social media. Um, oftentimes, I think people might be assumed that they're ready because they have projects that need to be published, which is great. And you want to have at least three projects that you want published for, you know, let's say a year campaign. That's the way I work. But maybe their website's not ready or they don't mm. have a social media presence. So before I even can pitch editors about your project or about you for potential profile stories or stories on your business or on your projects, I need to know that your website is ready because that's what a journalist is gonna look at. They're gonna Google you and they're gonna see, okay, their website doesn't really reflect who they are. So really ensuring that their online presence resembles what they want to project. So that's one of the first things that I look for. And if they're not ready for that, then that's part of the campaign as well. Right. How can we update your website so it exemplifies who you are? And imagery is a big part of it. I'm often surprised at some of the images that I see because I think that there's a mindset of, well, I don't have enough images, so just putting things on the page. And I'm of the mindset of, Less is more. If you don't have enough images, only put up the best work. Mm -hmm. That's very and interesting. Yeah, we, mm -hmm. that's, that's very interesting. So we do see a lot of um, design practices that will put up all sorts of images, every single project under the sun. And often there's a big variance in also the quality of photography. Right. Photography is so important. That's a big part of the campaign is having the right images. Because if we're just talking about just traditional media, that's what they're going to be publishing is your is your work, your images. So that's a key component of the campaign is to have strong images. And that's just one side of PR, the traditional side of PR, which is media placements. Then there's also you know social media, as I mentioned. And then there's also business development when it comes to introducing to the right people that could potentially hire you. Um, PR is very much related into um, how we relate relationships. So who do I have a relationship with that I can introduce you to? Um, and perhaps that there's a business that could be done in the future, maybe an architect meeting um, a builder or a designer meeting an architect. So really having people meet each other, um, creating that great synergy there. There's panel opportunities, speaking opportunities. So there are lots of different ways to engage and work in this umbrella of public relations. And each public relations firm will have a different way that they go about it. I have a multi-tiered approach. So it's traditional media, social media. Then there's the business development side. Um, there's um, opportunities for public speaking. So there's lots of different avenues to build your business, your brand and your persona. So when um, clients are approaching you, you use this word campaign and it's an interesting word that I'll often hear marketers talk about. What, what does a yeah, campaign look like? like? Campaign. What, is, what does it mean <laughs> what, for you? What is, it, what is a campaign? How do you go about designing one? What's included in one? 
after I have the initial meeting with a client on what it is that they're looking for. That's one of my first questions. When you think of PR, what do you think about? Because as we've talked about, so many people have different ideas of what PR is. So I always ask, what do you think PR is? What do you want out of PR? Sometimes people don't know. I don't know hmm. what I want. I just want PR. Okay. Well, let's talk <laughs> about what that means. Do you, Are you looking to build your business? Uh, you know, and usually I'll, I'll mention several things and they're like, yes, that's, I want all of those things. Sometimes people have a very clear goal in mind. I want to get these projects published and I want to meet the right people for more new business. So I get all different types of requests. So part of the campaign, which is kind of a funny word, is putting together a proposal, a strategy, maybe would be a better word for it, on how we're going to accomplish these goals. So um, generally speaking, it's a one-year campaign to start mm -hmm. um, to accomplish those goals. And part of that campaign, part of that strategy is the narrative, the storytelling. So me asking all of those questions and working with my team on creating a story, a narrative about who they are. Got it. And is, is, do you ever kind of end up working with a client and you can't find the story? Is there always a story there? Is there always a message? That's a good question. There is because I will ask enough questions to find a story. Because mm -hmm. if you think about it, just being alive gives us a story. We all yeah. have different emotions. We all move through the world differently. We all have different human experiences. And every person is unique. You'll never meet one person that has the same story as another. Just as we all have different fingerprints, everyone has a story. It's just asking the right questions to get that story. So in, in a lot of ways, I will be investigating as a journalist would to extract the key information to create that story. Got it. And is there a, a kind of maturity or a, a particular time where you would recommend that practices start to look for PR? Like is there, are there certain kind of key milestone events that you often see clients approaching you to start doing PR? Do you typically work you know, just in, like you say, like a year long campaign, or do you have people engagements that last for decades, if you like? Absolutely. I mean, I have clients that I've worked with um, for many, many, many years. And then I have clients who wanted more of a short term campaign, let's say they're launching product, or they're um, having a, you know, short term event or doing something that requires a shorter shorter agreement. But, um, you know, my favorite clients are the ones that, well, actually I do really enjoy shorter campaigns too, because it's very exciting and, you know, it's kind of, you know, there's a lot of buildup and it's a big, big ending, but I also very much enjoy longer campaigns where we're developing, um, and creating and working together as a partnership. So, um, it really, it, it happens all different ways. But you asked a particular question that I don't remember now. <laughs> um, yeah, is there is there a kind of a certain oh, when, set of when events? To do it. Yeah, when? Yeah. I think it depends on one if you're ready to up level, because oftentimes I find when we meet, there is a time requirement first that I'm going to be asking you a lot of questions up front to create your story. So. Are, are you ready for that investment? Because it does also require you know, financial uh, means to hire a firm, hire a consultant. And do you have enough projects under your belt that you want to get published? Um, that's a big part of it. And those, I think, are the two most important things. If you have enough projects that you want to get published and if you're ready in your career to up level. So it doesn't, it, so it's, it's less about kind of just one-off projects and much more about having a little portfolio of things that are ready to go. Yes, and so, a portfolio does, of projects. Does it matter in timings? Is it, is it kind of important to have? It does matter. Because if you did a project 10 years ago, it's not going to get 
publish now unless we come up with an incredible story as why it's relevant today. Um, so you want projects that are recently completed. Um, there's also opportunities to write uh, profile stories on your brand and your business and who you are. But just having enough content that we can use, a publicist mm -hmm. can use to um, showcase your work. And as I mentioned, there's other ways to work together too, through social media and through different events where you're speaking potentially at a panel or you're doing a talk, um, other ways to do public facing types of projects. So it really just depends uh, on where you're at in the process. Um, I wouldn't suggest someone just starting out getting PR. You're not ready mm -hmm. for it. If you're, if you're new to your industry, it doesn't make sense for you to have PR. It makes sense to have PR when you're at the point where you want to showcase your work, when you feel proud of your work, when you feel like you're ready. Um, you know, you're, we're always developing and changing and growing. So not to inhibit if, if, oh, you know, that project wasn't my favorite or this or that. It's just really when you when you have the sense of I'm ready to show my work to the public. Yeah. Now that's that's interesting that it's not something that you'd recommend a kind of a practice to do straight off out the gate for young practices. And I guess this is also part and parcel of why there's a bit of an accolade or a milestone in, of success to have a PR because it kind of, you know, the prerequisite for it is that you've got a portfolio of work which is worth publishing and worth showing off. Yeah, um, I would say three three projects that you're ready to get published. With that, though, if I worked with people before where they weren't really ready for a full blown campaign, but they needed some help with certain things. And I've worked with them as a consultant to help that process until they're ready for mm -hmm. PR. So getting published, you know, what, what kind of things are magazines looking for? What would be your advice um, for, for preparing a client to get ready to, to get published for a magazine? Does it need to be a specific project? Can you get published? Can you publish projects which aren't complete? Does that ever happen? Um, potentially, if it's a room that perhaps like a, a magazine or is doing a story um, on a certain theme, like kitchens or living rooms or there is a potential there, but generally speaking, you want it to be a completed project. Uh, and when you're ready to do that is when the project is complete. So you need to take photos. There's like several steps. First, you want to take photos of the project. I've heard people say even having a story in mind before you take the photos so that you can capture the images in the way that tells that story. Um, detailed shots are really important. I'm noticing a lot more magazines uh, showcasing work that have more of a vignette. So you get like a little feel for, for a certain area. Um, there's all different types of styles. When every magazine has their own way that they like to create their narrative and their story. And there's also every month the magazine has a theme. So having your your project align with whatever it is, is that they're they're talking about or showcasing that month. So what what is your relationship then with journalists? How do you kind of convince the journalists that this is the right project that they need to have in the magazine? What kind of um, structure do you you use to have that conversation? I think this is where where relationships are really important because journalists, editors, they receive so many emails and an incredible amount of submissions upwards of 200 emails a day, sometimes more. So if you don't have that relationship, this is why people hire a publicist, is having a relationship with an editor or a writer or a journalist, someone that will actually open your email and see what you have to say. And from there, it's your story and the images. So what are you showcasing? And is this a good story? Is there a hook, as we say? is uh, why now? Why does this magazine need to publish this now? Why should this newspaper publish this now? And then there's broadcast opportunities as well. For example, I had a um, designer who did a 
feature about New Year updates. So we aligned it and timed it with the new year. Um, there could be a story on green buildings. Maybe there's a publication that's doing uh, a focus on that theme, or I'm seeing a lot right now with trends related to non-toxic furniture. So not only do we, one, create the story, but two, we align with the news. That's what a good publicist does. There's, there's a couple of different ways to go about it. You create I the news, as in you create the story, or you align with a story that's going on. I see. Okay. So it's actually kind of about having a, a finger on the pulse, as it were, mm -hmm. and understanding what the different trends are. And here's Absolutely. how we could actually. We have to read useful. a lot. So you want to read as a good publicist is reading. The Wall Street Journal is reading. The New York Times is reading all of the magazines, it has a subscription to Architectural Digest, El Decor. I mean, all of the publications um, that their clients want to be in so they can also speak intelligently to why their client should be in that publication, why they should be in that newspaper or that outlet. Otherwise you're pitching pretty blindly. And oftentimes they'll get pitches that relate nothing to their, with what they call beat or what we call beat their topic. So really mm -hmm. wanting to make sure it's targeted and it's thoughtful, authentic. It's telling a good, good story why does the audience want to hear about this? You know, it's really easy for me to say or for, you know, architecture firm or for a design firm to say, like, I have this great project or here's this new new product. But why does the audience want to learn about it? What what is the importance behind it? It's not just a brag. What what's their what they're what are they going to get out of it? You know, what are they going to learn? That's interesting. Because it's it's often, you know, you can imagine from an architect's or a designer's um, perspective, you just finished this project, you're really proud of it. Yeah. Um, you want to show it off. It's kind of, a, it's you kind of want the story to be about you. But actually, the story's got to be providing value for, ultimately, for the, for the audience of the magazine. Mm -hmm. And the magazine's going to have its own agendas and its own narratives mm -hmm. that it's interested and keen to be following. Um, and as you say, there's things which are, currently trending which are also going to be more popular so being able to align yourself with that is massively important mm -hmm. um, and the story is you about you I mean it's about your work it's just done in a way that is interesting to the reader as well right do you see there being a big difference between architects and interior designers then in the in the kinds of way that you approach publications I always get the sense that interior designers are much more savvy, but I could be completely wrong. That's interesting. Savvy in what way? In that they they know how to court the media very well. Interesting. Well, I they have, think they often have much more of a more of the rock star persona, if you like. Mm. I think architects have a great. Ro I think they both have a good rock star persona. I mean, for me, I approach the media the same way I would with an architect mm -hmm. or an interior designer. Uh, it just, it's the same approach. Uh, it's just different projects and a different way to tell the story because an architect will have a different uh, way of being in the relationship to the work than an interior designer. So it's just telling the story in a different way. Mm -hmm. So it really... Um, it's oftentimes the same editor. It's just a different story in terms of Got it. what they did on the project. And then obviously there's different publications for architects that there are interior designers. So certain publications I wouldn't pitch an interior designer to um, because they won't write about the interior design. They'll only write about the architecture. So it really depends on which publication, which also goes back to making sure that the person that you're working with has a strong understanding of the publications that they're reaching out to. Do do you help the architects, interior designers find which publication is going to be best suited, or is it better that say the the client comes to you and they're like, "Here's the sector that we're trying to enter into. These are the trade press," or is it a bit of both? It's a bit of both. I look at it as a partnership, and I love to find out their dream outlets because those are the ones I really want to go after. 
the ones that they're the most excited about. So I always ask, what, what are your dream outlets first? Because those are the ones I want to reach out to. And if if it if I look at the dream outlets and think, okay, you're not going to be on the cover of New York Times, or you know, that's that's not where we're at quite yet. That's never happened before, by the way. Every client I've worked with has been very, actually, very uh, real in knowing where they could be, you know, placed. So they are usually very uh, keen on outlets as well. And sometimes I'll get a client that's like, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what outlet. No problem. I'll take care of it. I just like to know if you do have a dream outlet, that's the one I really want to go after because I want that for you. Amazing. What about getting clients out of trouble? So another part of kind of media relations is, you know, a project hasn't gone well or there's been a cost to overrun or perhaps there's been, I don't know, some kind of scandal and then there needs to be some sort of communications um, recovery yeah exactly like a crisis and there needs to be some sort of you know and it's normally the PR that has to kind of come in and help how yes. have you dealt with this kind of thing before in the past and I what have. sorts of things do you do it's you do? also it's a niche so um in design and PR you wouldn't really be considered a crisis publicist there's actually publicists that are only focused on that type of PR. Right. Okay. So um, I'm not trained as a as a crisis PR uh, person, but you know, just as in everyday living, we face the public perhaps not seeing us in the best light. Or mm-hmm. um, let's say you're in a relationship with someone and something happened; they heard something about you. I, I think those situations are very similar in the sense that you want to be authentic. Even when you watch things, you know, a celebrity getting in trouble or this or that, I find that people connect when people are the most real and transparent and authentic about it. So that's usually my advice um, for those types of situations is what did you learn from it? You know, how can, how can we mitigate this so that it's a learning lesson um, and it's, it's expressed in a way that's that's positive and you could use it uh, perhaps even for your own gain. Because I've even seen certain PR situations where it could have been perceived as really horrible and then it's turned around and actually given them more recognition. So it, it can be interesting, the whole world of um, crisis PR. It's, it's a whole other gamut. Do you help your clients just in the way that they kind of engage with the media? So what I mean by that, um, in terms of like, do you ever give any kind of media training, given your Definitely. background as, as, as well? Because sometimes we, you know, sometimes I'll I'll meet with a, a guest on the podcast and I'm like, hmm, you could do with a little summing summing. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. So there is a media training process in terms of um, how to present yourself. What are some key takeaways that you want to leave uh, your potential meeting with? Or Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing an interview, having a few bullet points that you want to discuss. So there is um, an element of media training, definitely. What kind of preparation? So this is actually a, a useful question for me to know. What kind of preparation do you do with, say, when when we've worked together in the past, and mm-hmm. one of your client comes comes on? They're always brilliant, and they're always you know kind of right. super clear. And they've got a great story. How do you get them to that stage? What well, kind of I have do- really great clients. I will say that I feel so blessed and grateful. I, my clients are incredible. They're doing. I'm being a good publicist, but it's true. I have fantastic clients and they're top of their game and their their work is stellar. So it isn't too difficult for me for, to have them communicate their work. So um, talking points, you know, having an idea of what it is that you want to say. And then if are they comfortable in front of the camera? Uh, really, it's talking to a friend, uh, mm-hmm. really just connecting. So we do go through some of this. And you know, if they need more work, I will have them work with someone who is a media trainer specifically. So there's there's specialties in everything, just like there's a specialty in, you know, crisis PR. There's a specialty in media training. And I'll certainly do work with clients in that way. But if they need more help, 
You know, I've, I've had a client in the past that was petrified, petrified of being on camera. So, mm. okay, you need a little more handholding. Let me get you someone who can really help you every step of the way. Because it should be fun. In a lot of ways, it is fun. And I found through my own back, acting background that excitement and nervousness is on the same chord. So if you're nervous, you're probably just excited. And how can you use that energy to have a charismatic nature or to express that energy in a positive way instead of a way that feels fearful or small? Brilliant. Love it. Um, mm -hmm. And in, in, in I have terms a question of... for you. I yeah, have a question for, for you. So because I've had um, a lot of clients on your show, thank you so much. It's been wonderful. What have you noticed? So I pitch you and mm -hmm. I send you emails. And before we didn't know each other and I would, I sent you, you know, requests and you probably receive a lot of people reaching out to you for your show. What have you noticed are things that haven't been helpful or have been helpful? So, I'd love so Norm to take yeah, normally what I find with, with you and your request is that you've already come with an angle mm. and they're normally, um, it's normally a good match. Yeah. Right. And it's normally a good match for what the theme of the podcast is. And you'll often have suggested here is, here's some of the business innovations that this client has, has been doing or what they're up to. And, and also you've often give a, you've often give a selection and sometimes it wasn't a fit and, but most of the time it has been um mm -hmm. and that's been really useful and then the kind of process that we've gone through of just having a little 15 minute um yes. warm-up interview session and then we can establish a theme and then and then we're ready to to run with it basically and yeah, I found so, that, yeah. that that works very well one of the most memorable interviews i think we did was with ryan that was been one of my favorite one yeah. of my favorite ones i know we had to take loads of that out in the end but it was <laughs> He was such a, like a wonderfully provocative character um, and really authentic in himself. Yes, and he's very was... himself. And people really appreciate that, that he's unap unapologetically who he is. And he's very talented. So, you know, he's very, and he's very young. So he's a unique person. Um, just, you know, everyone has their unique story. And what you shared is is really insightful because there's two different elements as a publicist that I hear back from you. One is targeting the right person. So I, or the right outlet. So I knew, okay, here are the stories that this particular podcast would be interested in. So I approached you one with knowing who your audience is and then giving you an angle, a hook or a story idea. So those are two important elements of, you know, approaching the media. Mm -hmm. No, I love it. I love it. It's very, um, it's very, very interesting because I think for so many designers, this part of engaging with the media, some people have got it quite naturally and mm -hmm. their personality lends mm -hmm. um, itself to being kind of quite engaging and compelling and networking and it can be a, na a natural extension of that. For other practices, the whole media aspect of it becomes quite a mystery and a bit of a frustration. Mm -hmm. at times as well because there's, there's plenty of super talented people that perhaps are not getting the exposure that they deserve and part of that is you know who you're working with who are the consultants that you're working with who are the marketeers that you're working with who are the prs that you're working with to make sure that that's that's happening um what would you what, what kind of advice would you give to those kinds of practices Hire a publicist. <laughs> you know, it's 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 difficult to do it yourself. It is very difficult because it's too close. One, you're not potentially able to see things in a, the same way in a safe, object, objective manner that someone else mm. would uh, that you would hire, and maybe there's elements that you're missing of your story. And it's very difficult to reach out to someone and say, "I'm wonderful. Here are the reasons why." You know, it's easier to have someone else represent you, and and you like you said, there is some um, respectability that it comes to in hiring a publicist. Not everybody can do that, and not mm -hmm. everybody can, will get published. So that already is giving you a lot of credibility. I think that's an important part of PR is that it offers credibility. Um, in a way that is earned because a journalist is not being paid to write about you from 
the architecture firm or the design firm or the publicist. They're writing about it because they think it's it's a great story. They think it's a great project. So um, it's it's really important to have the right um, the right way to express your story and express what you're doing that potentially you might not be able to do when it's your own project. I mean, some people do it. Like you said, some people are able to pitch the media, find out who it is. It's also extremely time consuming. Um, I had a, I had an editor tell me once you are the most um, persistent publicist I know. (laughs) And she meant it as a compliment. She really, this was, you know, we're very good friends now and we were good. We were, we were friends at that point as well, but you know, more of like work friends. And she meant that in a very positive way. She actually uh, introduced me to someone who was looking for uh, a publicist because it, it, it is, it is a lot of follow up because they're receiving so many emails. And even if they want to work on the project, they may not just have the time. So it is a lot of persistence and to do that and run a business is a lot of work. It's very interesting. I mean, I we find typically nowadays we only ever engage with PRs when getting guests onto the show just because it's so much easier. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we'll often, not so much these days, but, you know, it, it, it's a bit frustrating when you do get kind of mismatches. So yeah. sometimes you, that sometimes there's, you know, it's often people from crypto markets and, <laughs> things like that just putting forward someone who's just completely random and has got nothing to do with architecture and you're like why why are you approaching yeah that's you're, that's annoying vetted, you're vetted a little bit right if you have a publicist introducing you just as if you know if someone wants to write a book and oftentimes they'll say you know no blind submissions because they want someone representing you so yeah you know that there's there's already been a, a vetted process they're serious they're going to have someone send the materials that are needed at a timely fashion they're not going to forget you know this is their job so it's it's all of those things you would hire you're hiring someone to represent you uh to showcase how that person's going to feel about you what um you don't have to answer this directly Uh on how much on how much you charge but what would you suggest is a good kind of range of a budget for engaging with a publicist? That is a really hard question because everybody has different rates. Mm -hmm. So it it really depends also on what is it that you're looking to do. So I can't really answer that unless I was to know what is it that you want? What are you Mm -hmm. looking for? How long is the campaign? Um, What are your goals? All of those questions i would have to like find out all that information before i can come back and say this is what i would propose for everything that you want but just you know think about if if you were hiring someone in-house to do your Mm -hmm. pr it's uh probably going to be less if you hire someone outside than if you hired a full-time staff person right got it and and for small practices or startup practices if you like who perhaps they're not ready to hire a PR or publicist, what kind of activities would you recommend them doing themselves? What kind of things can a small business do themselves before they're ready to actually hire someone like yourself? I would say making sure that their a website is so important. That's your calling card. So making sure that your website really aligns with what you want to represent. So do you have the right images? Is there a great narrative about your firm, Um, your social media? Do you have a social media presence? It's better to have no pictures or one picture than a hundred terrible photos. You know, you really want your imagery to showcase who you are, your brand, you know, everything that I've said before. It's just, you know, I say this again and again, because I'm oftentimes surprised at some of the images that I see. As you mentioned, it's like, you know, people put like little detail shots and all of the images. And it's like, you don't need that. You don't need to put everything out there, only the best images. Uh, so I would say those are a couple things that you can do if you aren't ready to hire a publicist. And again, you know, there are as opportunities for consultancy and working with someone um, just to get a couple things going before you actually um, hire a full campaign. 
Have you come across um, some of these services like Bowerbird? I've heard of them, but I'm not familiar with what they offer. So they're kind of like uh, kind of more do it yourself or mm. like online PR solutions for smaller practices. Mm. I was just curious to know what your thoughts were on. You know, I've received some emails from them, and uh, I don't know what services they offer. So I can't really speak to that. Um, Got it. But I mean, it, I think I think it depends on if you have the time and if you have the resource to try something like this. I mean, I know I know a couple designers who have relationships with editors and they get projects published that way. So it certainly can happen. Um, it just depends if you have the bandwidth and are able and all of those things, or if you're really looking for a more um, tailored approach. Brilliant. What do you have planned for the rest of the year? For the rest of the year? In PR or my life? <laughs> um, no, in, in PR. In PR. You know, I, I, like I said, I'm really feel grateful. I have wonderful clients. So just maximizing and uplifting them as much as possible and getting their story out and having them grow and expand. Really, I'm, I'm excited for who I'm working with right now. Amazing. Brilliant. Well, what's the best way? How about way you? How are you for, with the podcast? We've got, well, we've, we've got some very exciting plans coming up this year where we're looking at making more in-depth types of movies, if you like. Oh. So we did an interesting kind of um little documentary style film with brooks and scarpa a little while ago and um we're looking at doing more of these kinds of nicely highly polished in-depth behind the scenes um interviews and also showcasing people's work uh called the smart practice series so that's why i'm very excited and we're going to be releasing a book so we've started Wow, I've, that's incredible. I started, started the, the beginning process of working with a publisher uh, here in the UK about doing a business of architecture book. So that, that I'm Good really... Good for really, you. Your, po really. your podcast is so informative and I really appreciate being on and hopefully it's helped demystify a little bit about PR and assisted. So thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited to see how the show develops too. It sounds exciting. Absolutely. Well, thank you. That's been really, really brilliant and always a pleasure to talk with you. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ryan. Good to see you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.